This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for your online store, marketing tools to develop your own website and much more. Hey Nova Ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking and lately people have been sending me links to this article on Facebook that talks about this battle that happened in 1582 between Europeans and Japanese samurai. All of this happening near the Cagayan River in the Philippines. Now in the past, as I was studying Japanese history, I did read about this incident but didn't go deeply into it. Clearly this mention made me curious, so I read the article and I found statements such as the following. 40 Spanish soldiers just defeated a thousand Japanese samurai. Okay, already the absurdity of this claim should sort of pave the way to what's coming. As you can see from the title, this is a debunking video. But I'm not attacking just one Facebook article. This story is all over the place. There are several blogs, pages on the internet and even a Wikipedia page that talk about this as if it were an actual historical event that happened that way. And really what the majority of these articles are trying to push is the idea of look how superior European men were and their soldiers because of their great armor and their great superior Toledo blades, they destroyed the weak Japanese and their feeble katana that clearly couldn't stand the power of the superior European steel. Ha! Eat that, you weeboos! Like, literally, I don't know where academia went. Well, luckily, I did find a couple of blogs that deal with this incident in a more professional manner. One of these is in Spanish. I'll leave a link in the description below if you can read Spanish, but the other one is in English. And it's actually an excellent blog that, generally speaking, deals with Japanese history, with professionalism, and it's this one here, Gunsen History. Highly recommended. But in order to make a debunking video, I needed to look at the sources and try to understand, okay, 40 men or 60 men, depending on who you're reading, are not going to be able to defeat a thousand samurai. And besides, what were a thousand samurai doing in the Philippines? So in order to really understand what happened in this incident in 1582, we're going to look at these things. What sources do we have that mention this incident? Who were the opposing factions? Now, when you come to sources, there are only two mentions. In other words, two letters, unofficial letters written by the Spanish. Now, this already should sort of raise an eyebrow because you understand that only reading one side of the story is never going to paint a full picture. Also, how come there are no official statements that talk about such an incredible event? But I will read both letters to you and we will examine their contents. Secondly, who were the opposing factions? So on one side, we've got a Spanish tercio. Now, we are going to look at exactly in details what a Spanish tercio of the 16th century was. But of course, these are extremely elite, highly trained, exceptionally well-armed and armored veteran soldiers, some of the best Europe had. So this part is true. But what about the opposing faction? What well, these articles tend to call 1,000 Japanese samurai, or as one of these articles said, 1,000 samurai ronin. I'm like, you're either a samurai, mate, or you're a ronin. But nomenclature aside, we are talking about pirates. They are referred to with a few names. One is in Chinese, this one here, the Wako. The Japanese name for that would be Wako, which is the one we're going to use so I don't have to deal with tones. Already, pirates, not samurai. So who were these Wako? What were they made of? How did they fight? Who sent them? We're going to look at all of these things in a moment. But now, I'd like to mention the sponsor that made this video possible, Squarespace. With Squarespace, creating your own website, blog, online store and the like is very easy. As you blog on Squarespace, you can use their share button, which is connected to all the major social media platform to help you create an online name. And it's fully configurable. The platform also allows you to gather monetary contributions for your cause and these can be sent as donations through PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, Venmo as to be easily accessible for all people. 
I really like the fact that Squarespace has this built-in email campaign system that lets you engage with your audience as you share your products or blogs with them. And you can also attach your logo to strengthen your brand name. Another thing that is really great about this platform is that it allows you to create members-only content specifically designed for your audience, while at the same time allowing you to manage and communicate with each single one of your members. So what are you waiting for? Head to squarespace.com and get your free trial today. Once you're done with your free trial, go to squarespace.com slash metatron and use the code metatron to get a 10% off your first website or domain purchase. And big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring my video. Most illustrious and excellent sir, I do not know whether the letters with the new information which the governor is writing today will arrive in time to go on the ship which has been dispatched to the sport of Akabite. So I wish to give your excellency notice of what is going on. Yesterday, St. John's Day in the afternoon, there arrived six soldiers who had gone with Captain Juan Pablo de Carrion against the Japanese who are settled on the river Cagayan. They say that Juan Pablo sailed with his fleet which comprised the ship San Giuseppe, the Admiral's Galley and five fragatas. From the port of Bigan, about 35 days journey from Cagayan, as he sailed out, he encountered a Chinese pirate, who very soon surrendered. He put 17 soldiers aboard of her and continued his course. One fair morning at dawn, they found themselves near a Japanese ship, which Juan Pablo engaged with the Admiral's Galley. With his artillery, he shot away the main mass and killed several men. The Japanese put out grappling irons and poured 200 men aboard the galley, armed with pikes and breastplates. There remained 60 arquebusiers firing at our men. Finally, the enemy conquered the galley as far as the main mast. There, our people also made a stand in their extreme necessity and made the Japanese retreat to their ship. They dropped their grappling irons and set their foresail, which still remained to them. At this moment, the ship San Giuseppe grappled with them and with the artillery and forces of the ship overcame the Japanese. The latter fought valiantly until only 18 remained, who gave themselves up, exhausted. Some men on the galley were killed and among them its captain, Pero Lucas fighting valiantly as a good soldier. Then the captain Juan Pablo ascended the Cagayan River and found in the opening a fort and 11 Japanese ships. He passed along the upper shore. The ship San Giuseppe was entering the river and it happened by bad fortune that some of our soldiers who were in a small fragata called out to the captain saying to him, return, return to Manila. Set the whole fleet to return because there are a thousand Japanese on the river with a great deal of artillery and we are few. And although Juan Pablo fired a piece of artillery, he didn't not and could not enter and continued to tack back and forth. In the morning he anchored in a bay where such a tempest overtook them that it broke three cables out of four that he had and one used for weighing anchor. He sent these six men in a small vessel to see if there was on an islet any water of which they were in great need. The men lost their way without finding any water and when they returned where they had left their ship they could not find it. They met with some of those Indians who were in the galley with Juan Pablos, from whom it was learned that Juan Pablo had ascended the river and had fortified himself in a bay, and that with him was the galley, which had begun to leak everywhere in the engagement with the Japanese. The Indian crew was discharged on account of not having the supplies which were lost on the galley. They said that the Japanese were attacking them with 18 champan, which are like skiffs. They were defending themselves well, although there were but 60 soldiers with the seamen, and there were thousands of the enemy of a race at once valorous and skillful. Moreover, I have just detained some passengers who were going on the ship because there are no troops on these islands and a hundred soldiers have to go immediately as a reinforcement, although the weather is tempestuous. I expect to be one of them if the governor will give me permission. These enemies who have in truth remained here are a warlike people and if your excellency do not provide by this ship and reinforce us with a thousand soldiers, these islands can be of little value. May your excellency with great prudence provide what is most necessary for his majesty's service, since we have no resource other than the favour your excellency shall order to be extended to us. June 25th, 1582. Most excellent and illustrious sir, your servant kisses your excellency's hands. Juan Baptista Roman. Now, 
Who were the Wako? Well, the Chinese characters used to write this term, generally speaking, mean bandits or pirates of the land of the dwarves, that usually was a sort of a pejorative term used to describe the land of Japan. So we could translate it as Japanese bandits or Japanese pirates. But were they actually Japanese? We'll get that in a moment. Still, the first point I'd like to draw is the fact that we're talking about bandits slash pirates. Now, the reason why I'd like to start with this is because I'd like you to reason for a moment with me. What the people who wrote these articles are saying is the following. They take the account of a group of European professional medieval soldiers defeating some bandits and they say, look, European soldiers defeated the Japanese samurai. It's literally as silly as a group of people go around and then manage to find some bandits of Italian origin and smack him in the face. And because of that, they say, look, we defeated the Roman Empire. Whenever you talk about piracy and bandits, yes, sometimes some Ronin, so former samurai, would join their ranks because, I don't know, they lost their job, they lost their honor, their master was defeated, whatever reason. But thinking that the entire totality of a very large group of pirates would be samurai is insane. Secondly, there is also the fact that the majority of these pirates weren't even Japanese. Professor Takeo Tanaka at the University of Tokyo proposed in 1966 that the early Wako were Koreans living on these outlying islands. But the current prevailing theory is the one proposed by Shosuke Murai, who demonstrated in 1988 that the early Wako came from multiple ethnic groups rather than one singular nation. We also have mentions in the Ming Dynasty, and please keep in mind that the Ming Dynasty, so Ming China, was one of the main forces that were dealing with these pirates wrote that the Chinese coastal provinces also suffered attacks from the Wako and that the Wako phenomenon was caused by the illicit trade which stretched from Japan and China to Southeast Asia. According to the Ming Dynasty accounts and several others, over 70% of the Wako were actually Chinese pirates from the following two provinces. And oftentimes they simply pretended to be Japanese pirates because they were known for their brutality. Now, as the writer of the article in Spanish that I linked in the description below mentions, it is basically impossible to be 100% sure of the ethnical constitution of these specific pirates that ended up meeting the Spanish. Some would have probably been from Ryukyu. So yes, from a modern point of view, they would be Japanese, but please keep in mind this other point of information. After the invasion of Satsuma in 1609, Ryukyu became a part of Japan's shogunate system. It became a prefecture of Japan through the abolition of the Han system and establishment of the prefecture system only in 1879. So, even if there were people from Okinawa, so the Ryukyu, in 1582, they wouldn't be Japanese. Still, was it possible that some of the people that fought in this encounter were actually Japanese among the pirates? Absolutely. Some of these pirates who were Japanese would have probably been from the Kyushu region, but still, this would be a highly diverse multi-ethnical group of pirates. And it goes without saying that this automatically means that even if there were a thousand pirates, which is a number that we will kind of work towards in a moment, but even if there were a thousand pirates, definitely you, you didn't have a thousand samurai. Also because the majority wouldn't have been Japanese in the first place. The Wako were marginal men living in politically unstable areas without national allegiances. And this kind of responds to, again, one of these articles that was mentioning the fact that it was Japan or main Japan that sent these pirates. The daimyo in Japan actually fought to try and remove these pirates because they were a problem. Of course, this doesn't mean that no daimyo ever made use of the pirates when it was useful to him, but stating that these were 1000 samurai sent by the daimyo is complete fiction. Alright, so who were the Spanish Tercios? As I said, the Spanish Tercios were an elite kind of troop that was, we could consider, one of the first professional troops of the early modern period. Well, using the maxim of Antonio de Leiva in the Pavia campaign, the Spanish companies should never be deployed to guard the city, but should be kept together in a core of invincible order, reserved for uncertain, difficult and hard exploits of war. It is also important to underline the fact that even though these are called Spanish tercios, uh, the majority of the troops were actually not from Spain. Some were from Spain, 
but many were from Italy, Walloons, Germans, Irish even as mercenaries. And these proportions would change. For example, in 1621, of the 47 tercios, only seven were Spanish. So even though they worked for the crown of Spain, we could consider them to be elite European troops. Now, the Spanish tercios are also famous for being the first one to use the pike and shot formation. In other words, even though at first they were pikemen and sword and buckler, so swordsmen, they will become famous for their usage of pikemen and arquebusiers, and later also musketeers. Remember that the predominant weapon in this period was the pike, described at the end of the 16th century as the queen of battles. By the mid-16th century, the Spanish full pike had to be around 27 Castilian palms in length, about 18 feet or 5.5 meters, and never less than 25 palms, so 16.4 feet or 5 meters. The overall weight of the pike will be 3.5 kilograms or 8 pounds. In this case, though, we are talking about Spanish tercios that were in the navy, so they were on a ship. Ship. So the kind of pike that these men would be using in this conflict would be the short or half pike up to 9.5 feet or 3 meters long, which is renowned for being used aboard ships for naval combat. Also keep in mind that officers would be carrying other weapons such as pole arms, like a partisan or halberds. Pikemen in the front rows would be wearing breastplates and usually helmets like the one I've got here, the Morion, but then as you go further to the rear ranks, not all would be armored and some would just be wearing a helmet. Each fighter was expected to carry a dagger, both as a weapon of last resort and as an everyday tool. Aquabuses and muskets would be considered main weapons. So already the fact that some of these articles say that it's the superior Spanish swords that defeated the Japanese katana kind of don't understand the purpose of swords, which were mostly used as a last resort weapon or in the specific case of Spanish tercios to execute wounded enemies once the battle was over. The aquabuses that they were using weighed about five kilograms and the muskets, which at this time, don't confuse them with later muskets, the muskets at this time are basically very big aquabuses that were used together with aquabusiers. They never really replaced them with the tercios at this time and they usually weigh about nine kilograms. Differently from the aquabus, they were usually placed on a fork and mostly used during siege warfare, but sometimes also during battles. A muster report in the Army of Flanders listed 1,237 musketeers to 2,117 arquebusiers with 1,047 armoured pikemen and 954 unarmoured. So of course these ratios would change depending on the time. We don't know how many of these men on this specific ship, what the composition was. Mostly pikemen, arquebusiers and some musketeers. Okay. Let's talk about the first letter and then we'll read the second letter together. They encountered a Chinese ship. They encountered a Japanese ship with which there was an actual encounter. Then they found the Japanese port, but they did not engage. And most importantly, the Japanese attacked and they were a thousand. With these pieces of information in mind, let's go read the second letter, which was only written five or six days later. And let's see what it says, because there are some contrasting points. Royal Catholic Majesty. By this ship, which is to leave these islands on the last of June of this year, I am giving your majesty a full account of the condition of affairs and events in this region. The fleet sent by me, as above stated, met two vessels of the enemy near Cagayan, one of Japanese and the other of Sanglais. An engagement ensured and those vessels surrendered after a fierce fight in which 200 Japanese, among them the commander of the fleet and his son, were killed, while we lost only three soldiers. So already we see a difference at the very beginning of the story. It doesn't mention the single pirate Chinese ship that surrendered and when it mentions the actual fight, it's not just one Japanese ship, but it's a Japanese ship and a Sanglis ship. Juan Pablo de Carrion, whom I sent as my lieutenant general in charge of this fleet, continued his journey and entered the Cagayan River, where he was to make a settlement. At the entrance of the river, he found six more Japanese vessels belonging to the fleet of those which had surrendered. Again, a different number. In the previous letter, we read 11 ships, and now instead it's talking about six. There was also a goodly number of people there and fortifications. On account of his lack of men, a severe storm having driven out to the sea the flagship, which he took on this expedition, he did not sack these forts, but attempted only to enter the river. So this part is the same as the other letter. 
This he did going up about six leagues where he made a settlement in a place where he could erect a fort, whence he could direct offensive and defensive warfare against the enemy. He asks for reinforcements and then says this. These occasions now are not so much a matter of jest as they have been hitherto. For the Chinese and Japanese are not Indians, but people as valiant as many of the inhabitants of Berberia, and even more so. I entreat your majesty to give careful attention to this and to order that in all vessels as many men as possible be sent, for it is the key to what is necessary for the preservation of this camp. I beg also that careful attention be given in the other things. So notice that now it's talking about Chinese and Japanese as the actual enemies that this fleet is encountering. Notice how in the second letter, the second encounter, whereby a thousand Japanese attacked 60 Spanish men who fought and survived, or actually defeated, is not even mentioned. So what can we learn from all of this? I think it's very important to be realistic about this. Oftentimes we like the idea of, wow, 60 men defeated, a thousand people attacking them, but this probably didn't happen. What happened was a minor sort of skirmish, probably even multiple skirmishes, we don't know, but some sort of confrontation between pirates of different ethnicities and Spanish tercios. As for the number 1000, which is only present in the first letter, we should take it as there were many pirates. I mean, imagine having to actually count them. Okay, it's 1, 2, 3, 998, 999, 1000. I doubt that that's what the letter even meant. It was trying to say there are a lot of pirates and when it said Japanese, as we have established before, it probably was Chinese, some Japanese, some locals. We don't know what percentages. So it is possible that the Spanish managed with a smaller force to defend against a bigger number of pirates and bandits. I mean, we're talking about professional soldiers against non-professionals. But turning that into 40 Spanish soldiers defeated a thousand Japanese samurai sent by a daimyo is fiction. Nothing in these two accounts should lead us to believe that that's what happened. If only 60 men were able to stop a thousand pirates in combat, why does this person ask for a thousand soldiers of reinforcement underlining that otherwise these islands would have little value. What, what, what do you need a thousand soldiers for? And ultimately this supposed second encounter whereby the pirates attacked the Spanish with either 11 skiffs or six skiffs, please remember that you can't put more than 15 men packed on a skiff it's a five meters long, very small boat. So good luck with the mathematics of putting a thousand pirates on 11 or even worse, six skiffs. It wasn't a battle against a thousand pirates. There was a large amount of pirates in these islands and probably a hundred or 200 tops attacked the Spanish. And it is a lot more believable that 60 professional medieval soldiers managed to stop a probably non-coordinated attack of 100 or 200 pirates the most. Still, a very interesting incident that occurred in 1582 that not many people know about. Okay, Noble Ones, well I hope that you enjoyed this video and what do you think? Did you know about the Battle of Cagayan and what are your opinion on these letters? Of course, you'll find both letters in the description box. Again, thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring my video and if you liked this video, please remember thumbs up and if you're not yet members of this community, become a Noble One. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron and check the link in the description below to make use of the amazing offer Squarespace is giving you. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.